Come on, let's sing together. The Lord, we come to meet with you again, to worship with one voice in adoration. For you deserve our every praise that echoes in this place. So come. Take the next 30 seconds and bless the name of the Lord today. Tell him thank you. Tell him, tell him his favor. Tell him how much he means to you. Just begin to say real words. Say, God, thank you for this this morning. Thank you for where I'm at today. Thank you for the way that you've provided. Thank you. Just begin saying it. Don't stop. We have infinite number of things to be thankful for today. Just begin to tell God how thankful you are this morning. Bless your name.
Let us sing for joy. Let us shout aloud to our King. So come and let us worship God, lifting holy hands. Bless His name. We bless Your and lift it up. We give you all the praise, Jesus. There's no name that's higher. 
no name that is greater than the name of Jesus. We thank you, Jesus, that we can hold on to those promises. They are yes and amen, Lord. We thank you for your loving kindness and your tender mercies, Jesus. Thank you for meeting with us here today. Thank you for your warm embrace, Lord, that we can find rest and peace and safety in your arms, Jesus. Thank you that you are our loving Father. We give you all the praise. It's in Jesus' name that we pray. And everybody said amen. Amen. Can we give the Lord some more praise this morning? Thank you, Jesus. Thank you, Jesus. We love you, Jesus. We are so thankful that you are with us this morning. If you can just make the people around you feel welcome, and then you can be seated. And if you're joining us online, we're so glad that you're watching. We love you. Uh, I love when we gather as the church. Something happens. Something incredible happens because it calls us into a greater story, right? Isn't it good to sing together? Isn't it good to gather and be reminded that there's so much more happening than just my story? And that's what Vineyard is about. We're a family. We're a multi-ethnic, multi-generation story walking this God story out together. And we just wanna say, welcome. We're glad you're here. Yeah, that's good. And if it's your first time with us, we just invite you to connect with us even more. And so you can text CONNECT or CONNECT R into this phone number on the screen. And we want to help you take a next step of being a part of this family and what it means to walk with Jesus together. One thing that we're pumped about that's happening, like today's the deadline, we have students going to summer camp. And summer camp, I don't know if you went when you were growing up, but man, God moves in the next generation in this camp. And so we're believing God to fill up the bus and to send an incredible group of teenagers to have their lives changed in Ocoee, Tennessee. Uh, as we go in the beginning of July, there's whitewater rafting and paintball, and we're on top of this ridge where everything's like a postcard. It looks like wherever you look, it's incredible. So if you know a student, if you have a student, tell them there is everything that's happening in the beginning of July is canceled because they need to be at camp. It's, it really matters. And so we love summer camp. Today, as well is the baptism class. Next Sunday, get ready. We're gonna celebrate together all the baptisms and all the life change that God is doing through this church. Um, but if you want to today to jump into baptisms next weekend, baptism classes are in the big room just outside these doors uh, right after service today. And then, uh, super excited to report back to you today what we have been able to be a part of. Uh, you guys remember Legacy of Hope, that whole project that we were a part of? Well, we have some updates for you today. And one of the things I think that's incredible as we even begin uh, to talk about it is we had a goal. Vineyard exceeded that goal. And we were able, yeah, praise God for that. And so, Beth, if you want to come on up, we're excited to hear from Beth Guggenberg today. Everybody give it up for Beth. All right, so Beth, where are we at now in this Nigeria project? Oh, Vineyard family, I actually couldn't wait to get up here and say to you, I'm, I'm so encouraged by the way you responded to this opportunity. You, you were faithful, you were obedient, and blessings are falling down on the other side of the world, and blessings are falling down on us, because that's how Kingdom Math kind of works. Amen, come on. And uh, so, yeah, my husband's been in Nigeria all week, so I've been FaceTiming with them the kids have been running around with his phone showing me pictures of what the progress on the schools that you all have invested in look like. We have some pictures for you to see right now. Yeah. Wow. We put together like professional videos for you to look at, but my favorite were the kids telling me what they know is going to happen in those buildings, what those buildings represent to them and to their future. It's, it's very, very, very exciting. We're going to have the buildings will open up for the school year in September. We're actually ahead of schedule, which never happens in construction. And uh, 
And uh, yeah, we're, it'll be fun. It'll be really fun. Yeah, a Christian trauma-informed school. I know this has been your dream for so long. Yeah. In Africa, you speak lots of languages depending on the region you live in and the tribe you belong to. But in this particular region, one of the languages that most of the kids are fluent in is a language called Hausa. And in Hausa, there's not an equivalent word for the word future. And so we're, we are like literally teaching them, hey, God has a hope and a plan for your future. Come on. And this is what part of that looks like. And they can articulate the hundreds of kids that will be going to that school this fall can articulate that they understand that God moved to the hearts of a church on the other side of the world on their behalf. And I can't even tell you what that means to them. That's awesome. And so it looks like, I mean, is it opening this fall? Or are it, we getting started? It opens this fall. And um, I mean, don't just take my word for it. A team from here at Vineyard Cincinnati is going next week. So you're going to get to see their faces uh, recorded and photographed in front of those buildings. And they'll come back and tell you the same thing. But yeah, we'll have classes opening this fall. That is so awesome. Incredible. Praise God for that, huh? I mean, that's come a long way from that first stone that we saw. I mean, that is yeah. incredible. I mean, especially because every one of those bricks they have to actually make by hand. You know, they're not like ordering them from the block company. They're, they're making those blocks <laughs> and building those blocks. So there's a lot of intentional effort being put into this work. So thank you. I love that. And so Vineyard Cincinnati, we got to be a part of that, a, a massive part of that. Like we helped fund that experience. And this all happens because you and I join in giving to what God's doing through this church. And so if you came prepared to give today, this is an opportunity to continue to invest. And so you can go online, you can text, you can give in one of the boxes. Uh, but we're just going to pray a blessing over this offering and over what, God, what God's doing in Nigeria. And so, Beth, will you lift us up today? Absolutely. Jesus, we bow before you and we just say yes to whatever you have for us. Yes, we'll raise our hand. Yes, we'll go. Yes, we'll share. Yes, we'll open our hands. Yes, we'll give you back what you first gave us. Yes. What you do with all those yeses, how you sew them together and bless people on the other side of the world who then in turn will bless others that we may never even meet the side of eternity. Only you can do that. So Lord Jesus, we just this morning say to you, would you release an anointing on this body that they would experience your presence they would understand your provision, and that they would fall deeper in love with you. Lord Jesus, thank you for what you have done here at the Vineyard and what you're doing around the world. Would you be with the team that travels there next week? Keep them safe. We pray these things in your name. Amen. Amen. How are you all? I am uh, so excited. If I haven't met you yet, my name is Beth Fuchenberger, and I am part of the teaching team here, and excited about being a part of this series called The Bible Explained. If you've been with us the last couple of weeks, you know that Matt's been challenging us to know the word so that we can know the word, right? John 1, 1, the word, the God, he is the word. And, and we want to know the word, not just to know about it, but to actually begin to metabolize the truth of this book. He left us last week with this idea that the Bible is really one great big story and it's a story that we're going to learn the rest of our lives here on earth, and who knows what it looks like when we learn it in heaven. But this story, I just today I want to frame it as a love story. It's a story about a perfect God who loves a broken people and who is covenanted. He has made a covenant that he will be in pursuit of us, that he will pursue us in our seasons of faithfulness and unfaithfulness. He'll, he, he's coming after us, right? I've said to you many times, this Bible <clears throat> is complicated, but can be simply summarized in these two words, come and go, right? He invites us into a relationship, and then we go out and tell the world about it. Well, I don't know what pursuit looks like to you. I was thinking about, when I was thinking about the idea of God pursuing me, what do I think pursuit looks like? Um, I met my husband, Todd, when I was a junior in high school, and we met in March, and I remember um, thinking this was probably flirtatious. It doesn't really sound that flirtatious to me anymore, but on our first date, we kind of realized real fast we liked each other. And I said something like, where were you last month? You're like a whole month late. Like all the girls in my school, Valentine's Day, walked around with like flowers and chocolates and everything. I was all by myself. Like you're like at least three or four weeks late. And again, that doesn't sound very flirtatious to me now. I think that was my attempt. But uh, the next morning, we went to two different high schools here in Cincinnati. And the next morning when I went to first period, there was a knock on the door and a, and a dozen roses delivered to my first bell with a note that just said, Happy Valentine's Day, Todd. 
And I remember thinking, okay, that was good. That's smooth. I like that. <laughs> and then I went to my second bell, and there was a knock on the door and another dozen roses with a little note that said, sorry, I'm late. I'm like, okay, you got my attention. And then third bell, there was another knock and another dozen roses, and there were eight bells in my high school. So I went home that day with eight dozen bouquets of flowers, and I remember my dad saying something like, who is this guy, you know? <laughs> and my mom just looked over at me and says, this is a man that's in pursuit. And I mean, Todd's a, he was a great pursuer then, he still is a good pursuer now, but he's actually just a shadow reflection of a God who is in pursuit with us. This, the, the picture that God, remember I've talked to you before about how the Bible should be seen in pictures. Like if I was trying to tell you today, hey listen, this is a God who's faithful. Faithful means all kinds of different things to us depending on what our experiences are. He, he paints pictures in our minds because it's easier to metabolize what faithfulness looks like in the idea of a picture. I want you to see God is, he is like, I mean, times a thousand knocking on your door with a dozen roses every hour. Sometimes we think in our relationship with God, we're like standing at the door begging him for scraps, hoping he lets us in and forgets what we did last night. That's not what this picture is. This is the picture of someone in pursuit of you. He loves you. He wants you. I had a, I had a hard week this week. I don't know if I'm in good company. If anyone else here in the house had a hard week this week, I don't wish it on anyone. I'm going to be just fine. I have a child in crisis. I have a frustrating health diagnosis. I have a father-in-law that I love who's in hospice. My husband's been in Africa all week. It's, it's, just, it's just been a hard week. And when things are good, we remember, like, oh, gosh, thank you, God. Like, thank you for the good things. When things are hard, I need to remember this picture of a God who's knocking on my door every hour with a bouquet of flowers saying to me, like, hey, I, I, I'm here. Can I carry you? Can I carry this? What is it that you need right now? And this idea in this series about the Bible explained, the reason we understand the Bible is so we get the right thoughts and thinking in our head. That's why our Bible tells us things like, take every thought captive, renew our thinking, set our minds on things above. Because, because God knows our hearts. Our hearts are unpredictable. They're, they're fickle. They change around. I can't just... Try to feel God's love. I have to know God's love. That's why we know the word, so that we can know those kinds of things. Because when I understand how God feels about me, how he sees me, how he created me, how he's in pursuit of me, it changes everything. I, 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 I believe him in those things that feel unbelievable to me. Like, how could you love me when I have been unfaithful? How could you want to help me when I'm in the same situation you helped me with before? It's a lifelong journey. It's not something that has any kind of like before and after picture or, oh, okay, now I get it. He's in pursuit of me. I never have to really learn that lesson again. This is, this is a part of maturation, sanctification. Every day we got to be thinking about a kind of process in our spiritual growth. Uh, because I was thinking back to that junior year in high school when I was thinking about pursuit, I remembered this other story my first mission trip, I was a high school student, and I went for the summer to the country of Costa Rica. We had seen an ad in a magazine, and I, I, my parents thought it was a great idea. I thought it was a great idea. It sounded exciting to me. I went off with these strangers to Costa Rica with this mission-sending organization, and about two weeks into that trip, I was having extraordinary culture shock, and not because I was in another country where they were speaking another language. I was having culture shock because this little Presbyterian went with a whole bunch of Pentecostals. And I didn't even understand half their language. Like, they were talking about, like, prophetic this and prayer language that. And, like, I, I, I mean, I'd grown up with the church, every VBS you could possibly have, Wednesday and Sundays. I mean, I was there all the time. I didn't even know what they were talking about. And so, you know, if I had been traveling with a bunch of adults, it would have been no big deal. They would have just oriented me, informed me, taught me about the theology that was informing their faith. But I wasn't with a bunch of adults. I was a bunch of kids. And so they began to challenge because I was like, what are you talking about? They began to challenge, like, maybe you don't even have the Holy Spirit. Maybe you're not even really saved. And I wanted to call my parents and be like, hey, what do you think about this? Am I saved? But I thought if I call them, then they're going to make me come home. And I definitely did not want that to happen. So I called my older brother, who was having his own mission experience with crew that summer. And, I, you know, I mean, I, this is 19... 
89. So I called him on a payphone. And I said, like, um, hey, do you think I'm saved? Do, do you think I have the Holy Spirit? And he said, uh, every time you feel convicted of your sin, that's the movement of the Holy Spirit. Every time you feel compelled to open up that big mouth of yours, that's the Holy Spirit. Every time, that's the way big brothers talk to little sisters, right? Like, every time you feel comforted by God, that is the Holy Spirit. You have the Holy Spirit written all over you. And that was like enough to get me through the rest of the summer. I got back home and I, I knew I wanted to talk to my parents about it, but I wasn't sure the timing, but word had gotten ahead of me. I remember the night I got home, we sat down for our first family dinner and my dad said, hey Beth, why don't you pray for dinner? But you know, make sure we can all understand you. <laughs> it all, uh, anyway, that night he took out a piece of paper. I want you to paint this picture in your mind. He drew a great big circle. And he said, this doesn't even make sense, but just imagine that everything there is ever to know about God lives inside this circle. And I was like, okay. And he said, well, go back to like Abraham. Abraham tell today, every book written, every sermon preached, every seminary, every everything, how much do you think of God man has understood yet to date? I took a minute and like drew like a pie piece inside that circle. I said, I bet this represents what man has figured out about God, what we have, what we know about the word, what we have had, ex what we understand and could explain about this word. It's like, okay, um, you're, you're 16. What, what section of that pie do you think you've gotten so far? So I made like a little sliver of my pie piece. I said, probably until now, I mean, I've been to a lot of youth groups. Like, I bet I can understand this much of God. He said, okay. And then he like scribbled around the rest of that circle. He goes, you're, do you understand? There's no more God for you to have but there's a lot more of God for you to know. You're gonna spend the rest of your life understanding who God is and how he feels about you. We have not figured this out. Get your mind and your hands and your heart open to receive more of his understanding because you literally want to metabolize how he feels about you. This isn't something to know, this is something to know. And I, I mean, it's been a long time since I was 16 years old. I remember sitting at that kitchen table and recognizing that this was never gonna be like a box I checked. This isn't gonna be like, oh, 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 this is about the, this is everything I'm gonna know about the Holy Spirit. No, I, I realized uh, that he was going to be reintroducing himself to me over and over again. And I, I just wanna say, as we get started in this Bible Explained series, don't be afraid of the journey. Don't be afraid if, if, if if you're just living in your little slice of your understanding of everything that man has, and God teaches you, reveals to you, exposes you to something all the way out here in the circle, don't be afraid to open up your slice. Like, this, this is what it means to know him more and to understand him more. And uh, we're going to reintroduce. I, you, you guys all may, some of you may have known everything that Matt taught to you last week in the book of Genesis. But that doesn't mean because you have all that knowledge that you have all that kind of understanding. Same thing with today. I'm gonna to teach out of the book of Exodus, something I've done to you all a lot before. You may feel like, oh, I already know that story. You may be familiar with that knowledge, but knowing the word, it require, it means depth. It means this, this metabolism. It means this expansion of our mind. In the same way we know people, right? Like I know Clay, I know Matt, I know Daniel. I know things about them. There, there may be some things about them that I've already acquired in my mind, but that doesn't mean I know everything there is to know about them or that, that those relationships can't get deeper. Like We don't come to church to remember what it is that we have already learned. We come to church hungry for what it is he still has for us. So this morning, I have a message in four acts. And for the first act, I asked for some uh, uh, volunteers to come on stage. They literally have no idea what they've signed up for. So be kind to them. But Humphreys, would y'all come up to the stage with me? We're gonna be talking about this idea of uh, understanding the Bible and, and the culture and the context with which it is written. And so uh, we're gonna to talk today a little bit about love, and we're gonna talk about love, we gotta talk about husband and wife love. So I got these guys up on stage. How many years have you all been married? 34, okay, so you're gonna sit right here on this chair. Yep, you're gonna stand right here with me. Yeah, 34 years should definitely get an applause in the church, that's a good idea. Um, I want us to imagine that this is 35 years ago and these guys are in love and he is ready to marry her. And um, this is a skit because, this, because we're gonna learn the, the Bible in pictures and I want you to imagine for a minute that I am his father. So 
all the imagination that is required for that. And he tells me, exactly, and he tells me he's in love with her, and he thinks he's ready to take the step to marry her. And uh, the, the thing that fathers would do back in the days of, of the time of Exodus, and I do not think this is a bad idea for 2024, those of you who have sons, but like in, back in the days of Exodus, in those ancient patriarchal biblical times, when a son told the father, I think I'm ready to marry this woman, the father would challenge the son, okay, son, here's what I want you to do. I want you to write down our history because before you go forward, you need to know where you've come from. And I want you to write down the history of her family because before you join it, you need to know what you're getting into. And that assignment would take the son some period of time where he was writing down the history of his family and her family. And the end of that document would be the history of their relationship. I met her then, and I feel this way about her that. And like, it would be a story. So that, that might be a fun after, afternoon exercise for you all. And then that document that this groom would create would stay in his hands in this, this future household forever. But each of the parents, I'm the father and her parents, like we want a memento of it. We want like a, a copy of it. So he would create something called a summary document, and he would make two identical copies of that summary document. It'd be kind of like the cliff notes of that, of that history. And in those summary documents, he would write down some of the promises and commitments that he would make to her. Like, hey, listen, I'm going to be faithful to you, and I'm going to take care of you, and I'm never going to leave you, and I'm going to love you, and the kinds of vows that we say today at a wedding ceremony. So once this guy has done all that history and he made his summary documents, I think he's ready. So as his father, I would get him a glass of wine, you know, again, imaginations, <laughs> and uh, stay tuned for second service, it might be real, but just kidding. And so then we would go over to the bride's family, so come over to the bride's family, and meanwhile, you're just sitting there. When you, when the, I mean, we know how this goes down. We've watched enough reality television show. When she sees him coming with his family and a cup of wine, she knows she's about to get proposed to. So he would offer her a glass of wine. If she drinks the wine, then that means she's saying, yes, I'd like to marry you. If she rejects that wine, then I'm sorry, that was all for naught. But um, <laughs> yes, she's saying yes. Okay, so you're so excited she's finally said yes. So you do a couple of things. First of all, it's gonna take you a while before the ceremony happens because now he has to go and prepare a place for them to live, a bridal chamber, which he would build on his father's house. Like that's what happens. You leave your family, you go live with his family. And you would build a room in your father's house that you would live in, and that would take you like a year. Like, and so you're gonna wanna leave her with something that says, I'm coming back for you, I promise. Like this is a deposit. I promise I'm coming for you, this is a deposit. Don't drink anybody else's wine. I'm coming back for you, right? <laughs> so in those days, that would have been a form of a coin. Of, of course, in 2024, we give people rings to, to, to remind them of a date that is coming when two people will become one. So you give her her, her little deposit. Okay, great. And then you say, well, you and I are going to go away because we're going to build a room for her. But your family knows that during the engagement process, you keep a light burning in your window. It's a, it's, it symbolizes two things. One, don't bring anybody's wine over here because she's already betrothed, like she's spoken for. There's a betrothed woman living in this house. And the second thing it says, it's a symbol that says, you can come back night or day for me. Like, whenever you're ready, I'm here ready for you. So your family would keep your lamp burning and we would leave. And we're gonna go over here and we're gonna build a house. And typically, in the days of Exodus all the way through the days of Jesus, this process could take this young man up to a whole year. Like, Depends on how motivated he is to finish that room, right? And so once, and he couldn't say the room was ready. There was this checks and balance system because otherwise he might say like, she doesn't really need a roof. I think we're ready yet. You know, it wasn't actually ready until the father said it's ready. And once the father said the room is ready, now it's time for us to go back and get your bride. And the way the groom would go back and get the bride with his family is they would make sounds, noise. If we had any kind of money, which let's make, Let's say we do today, because it's all play. Um, we would make sounds with trumpets. We would announce with musical instruments, the groom is on his way, and that, that, the, the word would get out before we even got there, that the music is coming and the groom is on his way for his bride. If we didn't have any kind of money, then we would just clank our pots and pans together. But it doesn't matter, we're, making it, we're gonna make a scene. So now we're marching back, you know, do, 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 do. And then you hear the trumpet, so now you can stand up, and you're gonna get here, come stand in front of each other. Okay, I'm now the rabbi. And so here we are. We're now at the wedding. And as the rabbi now, I would take a big white sheet and I would put it over their heads. That still happens in Jewish ceremonies today. That's called the hoopah. 
And that means there's nobody in this marriage, it symbolizes nobody in this marriage except for the groom and the bride. Like no mother-in-law in this marriage, no little sister, no ex-girlfriend, like nobody is in the marriage, just the bride and groom. Uh, uh, one second rabbit trail, 2024, commentary on marriage. I think we let too many people under our hoopas, right? Like this, this is only for the bride and groom. And at this point, our analogy is now going to be over because you're now married. So thank you. <laughs> Everybody give them a round of applause. Thank you. Thank you. That background is really important for us to understand because in one of the most well-known passages in the book of Exodus, God's kids leave the slavery of Egypt where they were underneath the yoke of Pharaoh and God releases them out through that parting of the Red Sea and then they go on top of a mountain and they receive the Ten Commandments. And in that scene, all the elements that we just watched of an engagement will unfold. Let's see if you recognize any of them in the scriptures. We're now in Act 2, the book of Exodus. First of all, God, he wrote down the history of his history and our history, just like that groom did before he ever offered the cup. That's called the Torah. That's the first four bo five books of the Old Testament. Genesis, Exodus, Leviticus, Numbers, and Deuteronomy. He made covenantal promises throughout that document to us. He said things like, hey, I'm the Lord. I'm going to bring you out from under the yoke of, of the Egyptians. I'm going to deliver you from being their slave. I'm going to redeem you with an outstretched harm, arm. And I'm going to take you, and that verb take in Hebrew is the same as marry. I'm going to marry you as my own people. He's making commitments, covenants, promises in the same way that groom was going to make to that bride gets them out of Egypt, right? They go through that Red Sea, and he meets them along the way. He's dressed in smoke during the day, and he's dressed like fire in the night. He's like a knight in shining armor. He's leading them through the waters. He's protecting them. He's literally feeding them. He's guiding them. And now they get to Sinai, the scene of the Ten Commandments. And God descends down on that mountain, and Moses ascends up that mountain. And in Exodus 19, God says, you yourselves have seen what I did in Egypt how I carried you on, angel, on eagle's wings, and I brought you, that's that same verb in Hebrew, to take or to marry, I've married you to myself. I want you to see the picture of the scene on the top of Mount Sinai as God's, he's down on one knee. He's asking Israel, will you marry me? This is, this is a story, it's a love story about a lover who is smitten with love for his people. And that lover is God. He's, he's the creator of the whole earth. And those people are, was, were Israel in, in this scene in Exodus. God, he made the world for love. He made people for love. He's, he wants to ravish them with his love. This week when things got hard, if I understand the picture of God as my lover on one knee asking me if I would enter into a relationship with him, I wouldn't hear him say things to me like, Beth, how'd you get into this mess again? Beth, you know you're stronger than this. Come on, shape up. Or Beth, you know, I got bigger issues to deal with than yours, so I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to just leave you on your own for a little bit. Or are you kidding me? Are we here again? If we hear voices like that in our head and we assign them to God, then we don't have the right picture. It's the reason we got to get the Bible explained. He loves me. So he's saying things like, hey, listen, I'm hurting because you're hurting. I, I, how can I help? Come here. I, like, I've got you. What do you need? How can I help you? I haven't forgotten about you. I'm with you. I will sit here with you. Throughout Scripture, God is always likening his relationship to Israel like a husband and wife. He does it through the prophet Jeremiah in chapter 2, the prophet Hosea chapter 1, the prophet Ezekiel chapter 16, the prophet Isaiah in chapter 54. He's, in case we didn't get the picture in Sinai, he'll say it over and over to us in the Old Testament. I love you. I love you with the only metaphor that you can understand. I love you like a husband loves a wife. I am in pursuit of you. In Deuteronomy 7 and 9, he says, I love you, I've set my heart on you. Not because you're mighty and strong, in fact, you're quite the opposite than that. Not because you're righteous, in fact, you're currently unfaithful. I just love you because I love you. 
That's how he feels about us 2024. He loves us just because he loves us. Not because of we attended church last week or we forgave someone this week or we gave our 10% this week. That, nothing that we have possibly done to earn it. He just loves us because he loves us. When Moses went up on Mount Sinai to get those 10 commandments and God descended on that mountain to meet him and get down on one knee, we read in our Bibles there was thunder and lightning. That sounds an awful lot like those trumpets and like that lantern. Those Israelites would have recognized those signs and thought to themselves, oh wow, this is a wedding. And as a groom, God said, I'm gonna go and prepare a place for us. In fact, the land is gonna be so amazing, I'm gonna call it the promised land. I promise you that I've got a place for us. And there was a great big cloud that came over that mountain, just exactly like that hoopah. And then God gave Moses the summary documents. And he walked down that mountain with two identical tablets. In fact, I think there were 10 commandments on each of those tablets, not five on one and five on the other. Even further evidenced by the fact that one of them went into the Ark of the Covenant. That's our copy of it. And if we read those 10 commandments, we, sometimes we use those things or we imagine those things as if they're a ruler to which we are to be judged and decide if God wants to be with us or not. That is not the way they were written. They were written like a groom to his bride, his future bride, with all kinds of promises and commitments in them. He said things to them like, remember the Sabbath and keep it holy. I want a date night with you. I want a night where it's not about anybody else but us. You shouldn't have any other gods before me. This is God saying, hey, no other lovers in this marriage. No other graven images. I don't even want a picture of another lover. I just want you to love me alone. Don't take my name in vain. I'm giving you my name. Wear it well. It's how the world will know who I am. We keep the Ten Commandments as a demonstration of our commitment in this relationship. Not because we're afraid of being punished. It's not a ruler. It's a love letter. That's what those summary documents are. And God says in Exodus 19, if you obey me fully and you keep my covenant, then out of all the nations, it's you. I pick you. You're going to be my treasured possession. What breaks my heart about this wedding is that while Moses was at the top of the mountain getting a copy of those summary documents and sitting under that hoopah representing God's family with God, his kids were down at the bottom melting down their wedding rings and making a golden calf. And God, who is not bound by time, he, he chose them even knowing that they were going to be unfaithful. This, I mean, that's the punchline. And he does, it, he's the same God yesterday and today and forever. He chose us, even knowing how we're going to be unfaithful next Saturday, even knowing our thoughts that will betray us this week, even knowing that my heart is fickle and unpredictable and won't always think and feel the right things. Like, he picks us, even despite our unfaithfulness. He loves us. And and God's family understood it to a certain extent. Three different times they're going to say we do in the Bible. Like well, Exodus 19, it says, uh, verse 8, all the people responded together, we will do everything that you have said. He'll, they'll say it again in chapters 24. Like, well, yes, yes, we do. We enter into this relationship. So if Act 1 is that cultural setting and Act 2 is that scene in the book of Exodus, come with me now to, to Act 3, which is Jesus being revealed this is, we were only partway through the story, but now Jesus is like, listen, I am a groom in, fa in pursuit of an unfaithful bride. I'm gonna come on earth and show you exactly what it looks like. And as he is revealed and as the groom is seen for the first time, I'm telling you, he was the most loving person in every single room he ever walked into. He was the embodiment of love, the embodiment of pursuit. And he reminded them, that bride, of their history together. And he reminded them of the covenant and the promises that he's made to her. Think about that scene of the Last Supper when Jesus takes the cup and he says to everyone there, like, I want to offer you this cup. He was doing it like a groom would to his bride. They all recognize that symbolism. He says, he knows we'll be unfaithful. But Revelations 3.20, those are red letters in our Bible. These are words directly from the groom to us. He says, here I am, I stand at the door and knock. I'm coming for you. I'm in pursuit of you. Anyone opens that door, lets me in, I'll come in and eat with him. He's in pursuit of us. Every time 
I take the cup, I think to myself, yes, yes. I'm sitting on this chair, yes, I'll drink your cup. I, I, I want this relationship with you. I love you. He's saying to me, like, listen, come into a covenant relationship with me. I, I pick you. Get under the hoopah with me. It's, we're not going to let anyone get between us. It's going to be you and I. I see you, and you are mine. And then when he left after his three years of ministry, and he died and conquered all sin and death and resurrected, and he, he left us with a, a deposit like, I'm going to go and prepare a place for you, but here, I'm going to leave you a deposit just exactly like that groom left something for that bride. He left us a deposit, sealing, the Bible says, us for that which is to come, and that gift that he left us is called the Holy Spirit. And that Holy Spirit continually gifts us all kinds of good gifts, like joy and peace and wisdom and mercy and discernment and provision and protection. He's a good giver. That was act Jesus revealing himself, saying, I've been telling you this story for a long time. Do you see me now? I'm going to lay my life down for you. That's how much I love you. I'll stand in front of that which is coming for you. This is what real love actually is. Well, act four is the, the act that is yet to come, the act that we're waiting for the fulfillment of that prophecy that we see in Exodus and Mount Sinai, one day we're going to hear the trumpets when he comes for us again, right? When he has finished preparing a room for us in heaven, it says in 1 Thessalonians, for the Lord himself will come down from heaven with a loud command, with the voice of an archangel, and the trumpet call of God. He's coming for us, and we're going to hear him. And you know what we need to be doing? We need to be sitting wherever we are with our light burning day and night, symbolizing to everyone who's watching, I'm already spoken for, I belong to him, and symbolizing to the Lord, you can come for me night and day, I'm ready for you. You can come for me night and day. Luke chapter, or John, Luke chapter 12 says, be dressed and ready for service. Keep your lamp burning, right? Don't light, don't hide that light. Don't hide it. Let everyone know who you belong to. I wanna come find you. And in John chapter 14, Listen, if I go and prepare a place for you, Jesus says, I'll come back and I will take you. There's that verb again. I will take you to be with me, that you may be also where I am. He's still courting us. He's still pursuing us. He wants to be with us. So today, again, you're going to have an opportunity to take communion. When I take the cup, I say, Jesus, yes, yes. Yes, again. Yes, I take it. Yes, I want to be in this relationship. Yes, I believe you're coming for me. Yes, I'm listening for the trumpets. Yes, I got my lantern out. Yes, I know that I can be unfaithful. Thank you for choosing me despite my unfaithfulness. When I read this story, this love story, I think I can't wait to hear how these, the next chapters go. I already know how the story ends. I know what he looks like. So when I think about this, this series experience and the steps that we want to encourage you to take in the season to come, one of the steps I want you to take is like, do you have his voice in your head sounding like someone who's crazy about you and in pursuit of you? Like, learn to recognize his voice. The only way you can learn to recognize his voice is you read his word, you read the story, you read the love letter, and you understand what he's saying to you. So that on weeks like this week, I know oh, wow, that, that's, that's not what he sounds like. This is what he sounds like. Because it comforts me and it strengthens me. The second thing I want to encourage you to do in this season is when you read anything that Jesus has revealed, any, any of that gospel activity, I go looking for what Old Testament prophecy is he fulfilling? Because he always is. This is how we sew that Bible together. Once upon a time, we had big books and had to go to fancy schools to figure it all out. Today, we have Google. Today, you have online tools. Any of us can do this. Go home and just look up trumpets. Go home and just look up lanterns. Go home and just look up preparing a room. Just, just start doing that for yourself and watch how Jesus revealed what he promised us from the very beginning of this story. And lastly, I can't encourage you enough. I want you to get the picture in your mind that Jesus, just like he was with those Israelites, wrapped in smoke by day, leading us by fire at night, 
providing for us when we're hungry, protecting us when we need protection. He's coming to you with the cup. Come and get a cup. Come and drink the cup. Come and tell him yes. Would you pray with me? Jesus, I just can't believe it. I can't believe it that as good as it felt to be a, a teenager pursued by a boy that by you it, 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 a thousand times more. You who never fail, you who never fatigue, you who don't keep a record of wrong, you, you love us. So Jesus, today, that's what we most want to experience with you. Would you, would you set our mind in heavenly places? Would you renew our thinking to understand you that way? Would you reintroduce yourself to us in worship as someone who loves us? And I pray all these things in your holy and precious name. Let's stand together and let's respond to that with singing. God, I live to worship you. All my life I offer you simple melodies of sacrifice. Open hands and open heart. You're the only one I want. Your presence is my treasure, my delight. So fall, I pray. Holy Spirit, fall, I pray. Holy Spirit, have your way. Let your glory fall. Let your glory fall down. One thing I ask, one thing I seek, so much more than anything, to dwell with you, your house, for all my days. So knowing you is everything, so I let go of lesser things. For you alone are worthy of my praise.
like the Lord impressed upon my heart, prioritize today participation over observation. So we have one worship song left this morning. We're gonna sing about how he loves us. And I just, I know we have all kinds of different personalities in here. I know we have all kinds of storylines going on, but I, I really want to encourage you to think about the next few minutes engaging in participation. For some of you, participation will be singing with all your heart or raising your hands. For some of you, will be taking communion. For some of you, will be coming forward for the, with the prayer teams. But what I just wanna invite you to do during the song is if you've had a week like I have, you'll find me up here. I'm gonna kneel in front of this, this altar, in front of this place and say, the Lord, I hear you. I hear how you love me. And that's enough for me right now. And and if you're in the balcony, I bet this feels like a really long walk, but we want you down here. And those of you who feel comfortable, you can come and just pray on the backs of those people. You don't have to talk to them. Don't, don't feel like if you come down forward, anyone's gonna ask you anything. You don't have to talk to anyone. You just come forward in front of this altar. Y los que hablan español, pues mis amigos latinos, así es como decimos iglesia ahí. So, muéstralos, venga, venga, para que se, se puedan ver, así, así se pueden alabar al Señor aquí enfrente. Okay? So whoever you are, come and worship with us in this last song and recognize that this is true for every one of us. He's crazy about you Amen. and he loves you.
the grace in his eyes if grace is an ocean we're all sinking so heaven meets earth like a passionate kiss and my heart turns violently inside of my you're worthy God if you don't if you don't know what else to say just say that over and over again you're worthy God
Holy Ghost. Um, okay. Oh, if you're on part of the prayer team, would you make your way to your places? If you came here today with a storyline um, that you want prayer for, these guys are both gifted and called to intercede on your behalf. Some of the storylines that you may be walking through, God has already been talking to this prayer team about, and they've already been interceding for you. You'll see some of those reflected on the ministry slide up there. Just recognize God has prepared in advance intercession and breakthrough for you. Come forward for prayer. And if something you're walking through isn't represented by that slide, don't hesitate to come forward again. I heard the Lord say, prioritize participation over observation. Come get prayed for this morning. It would be our honor and joy to do that. Make sure you come back next week, whether you're joining us online or in person, as we continue the series, The Bible Explained. God bless you and thanks for being with us this week.